Welcome back. And now for the news in detail. We start from Doha, where the delegates representing the Taliban and Kabul have pledged to follow a roadmap for peace based on a monitored peace process. U.S. Envoy Zalmay Khalil Saad says peace talks with the Taliban were resumed today after a pause for the talks. In a joint statement after the first intra-Afghan dialogue in Doha, Taliban and Kabul delegates agreed to reduce violence in Afghanistan. The statement includes a commitment to a monitored peace process, the return of internally displaced people and regional non-interference in Afghanistan. U.S. Envoy Zalmay Khalil Zad congratulated the participants for finding a common ground. Thanking the hosts, Qatar and Germany, he said the dialogue gives hope of an end to the 40-year war. Around 70 delegates took part in the two days of negotiations in the Qatari capital. Moving on to Iraq, where the three more ISIS militants have been killed during a major U.S.-led anti-terror offensive in central and northern Iraq. Officials say the forces continued their advance for a second successive day, destroying militia positions and weapons. Iraqi soldiers, backed by U.S. air power, have pushed into the provinces of Nenwa, Salahuddin and Amba in pursuit of ISIS militants. Gunship helicopters destroyed a vehicle in Nanwa province, killing three ISIS fighters. And Salahuddin troops found four car bomb-making sites and seized over 30 Katyusha rockets. The Saudi-led military coalition in Yemen says it has intercepted more drones launched by Houthi rebels as civilian targets in the kingdom. The rebels deny targeting civilians, saying they attacked the Aba city airport and a power plant with their bomb-laden unmanned flying vehicles. The rebels have increased the use of drones to target the southern Saudi Arabia over the past month. Earlier, the Saudi-led coalition claimed it foiled a Houthi attack on a commercial ship in the Red Sea. The Houthis denied launching any attack on shipping. The United Arab Emirates says it is reducing its troops deployed in war-torn Yemen. Abu Dhabi says the drawdown has been discussed extensively with Riyadh. A UAE official says Abu Dhabi is moving from a military strategy to a peace plan. He says the UAE will remain committed to internationally recognized government of President Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi. A spokesman of the Saudi-led coalition says both the UAE and Saudi Arabia are committed to their goals in Yemen. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned with Intest News. Welcome back. UN Nuclear Agency has confirmed that Iran has begun enriching uranium beyond a limit set by the 2015 nuclear deal. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence says Washington doesn't want war with Iran but is ready to protect its interests. Offering to talk to Iran on the nuclear program, Pence says Iran should not confuse American restraint with a lack of resolve. He says the 2015 nuclear deal was disastrous and there will be no more pellets of cash for Iran. Iran says the world powers will not negotiate a better deal than the 2015 nuclear accord. Foreign Minister Javad Zarif says global powers must uphold their commitments under the deal if they want Tehran to return to agreement. For more on U.S.-Iran issue, we are joined by Mr. Jeffrey A. Stacey, who is a national security consultant and former State Department official in Obama administration. Thank you, Mr. Stacey, for your time. First of all, I would like to ask, Iran claimed it has breached the uranium enrichment cap. How serious do you think that the U.S. can take this statement? I think they are, and I think this was expected, uh, similar to what your previous guest implied, because, of course, Iran has been backed into quite a corner here with the maximum pressure campaign. And it's correct. The Europeans and others, the Iranians themselves, are quite correct that the Trump administration really instigated this crisis. 
but in terms of at least the economic pressure, it's been rather successful. And so what the Iranians are doing is actually something not entirely illogical by any means. They haven't left the deal completely. They're only going to engage in this higher ratio enrichment to a limited degree, not something that will get them anywhere close to a breakout towards actually putting a nuclear weapon together. And it's also fairly reversible. So it sends a signal primarily to the Europeans at the moment that Iran would like them to do more to circumvent the U.S. sanctions on one hand and to put pressure on the Trump administration on the other. Now, unfortunately, the Europeans are not really playing by this script and they're reacting quite negatively to the second step now that in a relatively minor way breaks some of the stipulations of the deal. And so that means that Iran is going to get more frustrated. That means that the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, which is holding more sway these days, is probably going to order some additional attacks from some of the Iranian subordinates around the region. That's probably what we're going to be seeing next. And that's where we get to the danger of escalation. If one of those attacks hits a U.S. ally or comes close or hits a U.S piece of military hardware, then that's where we could get into a rapid escalation and a sizable conflict, and that's what needs to be avoided. Mr. Stacey, uh, as far as if we talk about the U.S. action against Iran, a unilateral action, pressure and sanctions on Iran, and what uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said is going to get fully further isolation. So do you think this is um, it is going to escalate when big countries like China and Russia are saying, look, you need to calm this down and you need to stop this. Well, what would be helpful is if uh, Beijing or Moscow would actually mediate something successfully. Neither of them have shown any ability to do so, but it would be welcome were they to figure out a way to do just that. We've already seen the Japanese fail at this at the highest level with Prime Minister Abe talking to the Supreme Leader himself. But at least we got some positive news that Emmanuel Macron from France, good phone call with President Rouhani, and they, and they agreed. We don't have all the details yet, but at least diplomatically speaking, they're talking about continuing to work for some off-ramps here to this crisis, and that's positive news. Mr. Stacey, when it comes to Europe, it has been making slight progress with Iran. Well, they look much more open and at ease uh, with Iran than that of the U.S. Do you think Iran is warming up to Europe? Well, indeed they are, because they know that um, they've got more open ears in Europe. You've got Trump critics all over the continent. And Iran sees a potential advantage here, and they should pursue it. So this Rouhani-Macron development is quite positive. What the Europeans haven't figured out how to do, and haven't really decided definitively to do, is to f move significantly away from the U.S. sanctions and help Iran, for example, export oil. Now that would be a, be a dramatic step and the Iranians, or excuse me, the Europeans fear the U.S. response. They fear sanctions themselves. They're also in a bit of a trade war with the U.S. that is also entirely unnecessary. So things are delicate and by no means are the Europeans lining up in full support of Tehran. I think actually they're doing a bit of the opposite as they're responding negatively to now the second minor breaking of the deal. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey Stacey, for joining us from Washington, D.C., for the insight on the U.S.-Iran issue. For now, we'll move on to Germany, which has turned down Washington's request to send ground troops to Syria. A government spokesman says Berlin will continue to be part of the U.S.-led anti-ISIS coalition. Earlier, U.S. Special Envoy James Jeffrey said Washington warns Berlin to replace American troops in northern Syria. The mandate for Germany's participation runs out on October 31st. Last year, U.S. President Donald Trump declared victory against ISIS and ordered the phased withdrawal of all the American troops.
23 U.S. governors have joined California in opposing U.S. President Donald Trump's plans to relax vehicle mileage standards. Trump plans to roll back through tough fuel economy standards imposed by former President Barack Obama. These measures were aimed at greening the U.S. transportation sector, which accounts for one-third of carbon dioxide emissions. Trump has backtracked on many policies the Obama administration put in place to fight global warming. He withdrew U.S. from the Paris Climate Accord in June 2017. Trump has called the accord unfair, ineffective and very, very expensive. They sought to punish our workers, our producers and manufacturers with ineffective global agreements that allowed the world's worst polluting countries to continue their practices. These radical plans would not make the world cleaner. They would just make and put Americans out of work. Moving on, the U.S. has approved $2.2 billion arms sale to Taiwan in a move bound to anger China. The deal includes over 100 tanks and 250 Stinger missiles. Beijing has previously expressed serious concerns about the potential sale. The U.S. Congress has been notified about the arms deal and has 30 days to object to the sale. The deal is in a violation of Beijing's One China policy. It con considers Taiwan a renegade province. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has offered to hold talks with the Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. In the meantime, senior EU officials have pledged more aid for the Eastern European country. President Zelensky has proposed discussing Russian annexed Crimea and the conflict in eastern Ukraine with the separatists. The Ukrainian leader has called on world powers to mediate. Moscow is yet to respond to the offer. European Union leader Donald Tusk and Jean-Claude Juncker have pledged financial assistance to conflict hit Ukraine. In Albania, thousands of opposition supporters have resumed protests calling on Prime Minister Edi Rama to step down. They say the country's accession to the EU may be blocked if there is no change at the top. Demonstrators in Tirana called for Rama's resignation over corruption and electoral fraud allegations. Rama, who won a second term in 2017, has dismissed all concerns about the election results. The opposition says Rama could jeopardize Albania's accession to the European Union. EU member states are due to make a decision later this year. The U.S. capital Washington, D.C. has been hit by historic flash floods following a record rainfall of 3.5 inches over two hours. Rainwater gushed into metro stations and basements, including the White House. Fast-flowing water flooded many local roads, stranding vehicles. Rescuers on boats saved drivers stuck in their vehicles. The flood led to electrical outages, shutting down the National Archives building and museum. The local Met Department says the risk of flash flooding in D.C. has increased because of recent heavy rains. Mexican police have rescued 51 migrants from a truck. The migrants were discovered after an X-ray image showed people hidden in compartments inside the truck's trailer. Mexican officials say they were taken into the care of the National Migration Institute, which will process them for their possible return. Mexico is trying to curb a surge of people crossing its territory to reach the U.S. In May, U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to impose tariffs on all Mexican goods if it did not slow the flow of migrants crossing the border. France says the Vatican has lifted the diplomatic immunity of its Paris envoy, who is under investigation for alleged sexual assault. 74-year-old Luigi Ventura is facing four complaints of sexual abuse. French prosecutors asked the Vatican in March to lift Ventura's immunity to investigate him. China is employing a new harvesting technology to alleviate poverty in the coastal province of Guangdong. Let's take a look at this report. 
Guangdong province is one of the most backward areas in China. People rely on traditional farming methods to earn a living, but now a new technology is being used to boost yield. Because this village has the tradition of planting oil teak millet, we decided to make this the leading industry for poverty alleviation. Through joint efforts by the local government, we have transformed the village's infrastructure and appearance. Large-scale infrastructure development and road facilities have also been carried out. The effort has greatly improved the public facilities. Poor households are being trained on new harvesting methods. Poor households within our company will be given free training on the technology and will be provided with free fertilizer. We promise to buy back their tea fruits first. We give priority to poor households when employing people and hope to eventually help them get out of poverty and become rich. Today, the farmers of Guangdong province no longer depend on harvesting oil tea grains by hand. They can now produce as much in one day as they previously used to in 100. These efforts are in line with Beijing's plan to boost agriculture industry. Whimsical and cleverly decorated sculptures of hay and straw have been put on display in France. The massive artworks have been created at France's annual contest for sculptures in the French Alps. Let's take a look at this report. France's unique sculpture contest is nothing less than a challenge for the artists. The sculptors have a free choice of theme, but they have to create monumental sculptures filled and covered with straw and hay. Twelve sculptors from around the world have to accomplish the task in just five days. The sculptors who make sculptures have several skills for their art because they have to understand the resistance of the materials, work with the blueprints and master all of that. Especially the hay and straw, they are materials which are very flexible. Chameleon, a giant lizard constructed by a Lithuanian team, won the jury and youth audience prize. Russian's team sculpture titled The Power of the Subconscious grabbed the second spot. In the circles from a Czech team clinched the bronze medal. You have to have improvisation and adaption. You are given the necessary materials to make what you want and all of the artists here are great people. And me, working here at Valor, it's my life story. Each sculptor was given 600 kilos of hay and 400 kilograms of straw to create the massive artworks. They will remain on display throughout the summer. Lows and the highs of the business world now. The U.S. has announced fresh duties on some Mexican and Chinese steel goods, alleging unfair subsidies for manufacturers. The U.S. Commerce Department says imported steel used in construction benefits from subsidies in China, Mexico and Canada. It says the subsidies are negligible in Canada's case, so no retaliatory duties have been imposed. The action is in response to a grievance lodged in February by the U.S. steel producers. U.S. customs agents will begin collecting import duties based on the subsidy rates, but the funds could be returned if officials reverse the findings. Asian stocks have fallen to their lowest levels in the two and a half weeks after hopes dwindled for a hefty U.S. interest rate out. Mainland Chinese shares slipped significantly, as did Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index, Australia's ASX 200 and South Korea's Kospi indices declined as well. Japan's Nikkei 225 recovered marginally after slipping in early trade. The dollar traded at a three-week high. And now the weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For further updates, stay tuned to Indus News.